Welcome to today's Global Connections television program. I'm Bill Miller. The main purpose of this show is to promote a discussion of major international issues such as war and peace, economic and social development, climate change, and human rights that impact people worldwide. New knowledge will inspire, involve, and motivate all of us to better deal with these challenges and to help create a better world. Today's program will focus on some very serious topics and some that are a little lighthearted at times. We're going to be talking about a connection between Ebola, the environment, and happiness. We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're shining the spotlight on the Ebola virus as well as the environment and the issue of happiness. My guest today is an expert on all three of these issues. My guest today is Dr. Judy Kuriansky. Dr. Judy Kuriansky is a renowned international psychologist, humanitarian, author, United Nations advocate, award-winning journalist, and media personality. She is popularly known as Dr. Judy for giving advice on radio and TV for over 30 years. Dr. Judy Kuriansky, welcome to today's Thank Global you. Connections program. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate you being with me. Let's get right into this. Ebola, a very serious topic. Ebola ravaged uh, many, several countries in Africa, especially Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. You went to Sierra Leone, and we're going to see a clip of some in a few minutes of your adventures there. Yeah. But how did you get involved in the Ebola issue? I know you've been involved in helping people who have been hit by natural disasters, man-made disasters over the years, but how did you get involved in dealing with the Ebola crisis? Well, at the time that this terrible disaster was striking all these countries you mentioned, and around the world, I was the chair of the Psychology Coalition, and so we recognized that while there was a lot of attention on the total devastation of the deaths and people's lives being in ruin and the economy being devastated, that there wasn't enough attention on the psychosocial issues, the fact that people were suffering emotionally and that they would be suffering emotionally for a long time, just as from the earthquakes they'd been to in Haiti and Japan and China and all around the world. And so uh, we held a forum where many ambassadors from the UN were present and sponsored it, and WHO was there, and UN Women, and UNICEF. And so uh, there was someone from U U Israel Aid there, and he said to me afterwards, Judy, why don't you come and help out? Um, and help me get together some training programs and workshops for the children and the orphans and the, uh, the helpers and the first aid responders and all of these people. And so he said, come in a week. Just, and I said, okay, uh, I'll be there. And that's you were there. That's how it <laughs> that's happened. How it yes. Happened. And of course, in your spare time, you've also written a very interesting book. It's the psychoso Psychosocial Aspects of a Deadly Epidemic, What Ebola Has Taught Us About Holistic Healing. What is the thrust of this book? Well, it is about the psychological and psychosocial issues that people are suffering from at the time during Ebola and then who will be suffering from this all over the world. Those not only in the region, but all the diaspora and the people who love their family members and everyone who they know and the rest of us because there are other diseases as well. So it highlights all of those emotional issues that people are going through, the stigma that still exists about this. The fears and the anxieties and the trauma of the losses and those lingering issues. Exactly. You have been, visited Sierra Leone. You were there during the Ebola crisis. Yes, you went I was. back after the Ebola crisis. Yes. And you also produced a very interesting video on your experiences. What we're going to do is take a few minutes and take a look at the video and we'll come back and talk about it and see if a okay. picture is worth more than a thousand words. Let's so. go to the video. Okay. I've gone through a lot. I lost nine of my family. 
my mother, my wife, my brothers and sisters, all of them died. Memories of those dead bodies, you know, caused fear to us. I face something stigma in the community. The Ebola epidemic hit West Africa hard in March 2014. Schools were shut, streets, businesses and beaches became bare, curfews and the ABC rule to avoid body contact restricted touching, especially dead bodies. Fear, stigma, myths. People were um, actually attributing the many deaths to a witch plane. Loss and unfathomable trauma spread as fast as the virus. We're all connected, right? To address such threats in mental health and well-being, I went to Sierra Leone to help provide psychosocial support, as I'd done after many disasters worldwide. We conducted trainings and workshops for children, communities, burial teams, healthcare workers, and many groups. Nearly a year later, by November of 2015, when I returned to the country now Ebola-free, it looked like a new world. With bustling streets, busy stalls, packed buses, weddings, people hugging with the ban on touch lifted, schools reopened. I want to be a doctor. And beaches packed with people. Life looks like it's back to normal on the outside, but it's not the same story on the inside. Don't know where to sleep, even to eat. People stigmatize us. Some of my friends, like uh, for instance, they run away from me. I'm out of the job. We don't have place to live. We are in the streets right now. My side is aching, my stomach, you know, my head. The women, they lost their husbands. Yeah, they say, look, you are, you are still having the virus in your system, so I cannot accept you anymore. Research proves psychological problems are long-lasting after crisis. It's the reason why my colleagues and I raised consciousness about the psychosocial issues in Ebola at this panel at the United Nations, organized by Voices of African Mothers, and at this forum at the UN in December 2014 that I co-organized in my role as chair of the Psychology Coalition with sponsorship and panelists from many missions to the United Nations, Liberia, Guinea, Uganda, the U.S., as well as NGOs and U.N. agencies like UNICEF and WHO. All that inspired my trip to the Ebola-stricken region to help build resilience and capacity with the efforts earning the blessing of high-level officials. <laughs> to counteract hopelessness from the drastic disease, my songwriting partners and I wrote a theme song about hope. Hope, yes, but the mental health and psychosocial needs in the region are drastic. In these um, countries, all of them had less than one psychiatrist per one million population. They were psychologically traumatized after the war and then during the course of Ebola. The importance and the impact of mental health here in Sierra Leone is evident at this conference. The theme of this mental health conference is the popular phrase, building back better. Local presenters joined international experts who came from countries like the UK, Spain, the Netherlands, and the US to present their work in many partnerships with local Sierra Leoneans. Support for recovery is happening for survivors in this network supported by the government. We educate people, we render some um, psychosocial support. <laughs> For community members affected by Ebola, welcome back, as shown in plays like this one. And for youth, in programs like this one founded by a former burial team member, in these workshops I co-developed for children's resilience being rolled out, and this camp supported by the First Lady of Sierra Leone and UNFPA to teach girls about issues like climate change, waste management, and self-esteem. I'm brilliant, I'm smart, I can change the world. Celebrating heroes. It's a major theme in Ebola recovery. Ebola survivors are heroes. Government officials who stepped up to the plate are heroes. I quarantined homes with an absence of medical teams coming in. All responders, helpers, and the people are heroes. You did an amazing thing for everybody and for your country. Despite advances, there is much to be done and many needs. What we look for from the government's part is to also make the necessary changes in the national constitution that discriminates and stigmatizes against people who are mentally ill. We need counseling, we need medical support. The money is not enough for us. I'm asking you guys for you to support these orphans in the schools. But ultimately, hope is alive. You love me, 
I love you, hope is time. What we are survivors, so we, we will, will survive. survive. <laughs> love together, hope is time. Dr. Judy, that was a very interesting <laughs> overview of your experience, and I'm sure it's very moving for you to see it again because that was a very heart-wrenching time, but the situation has improved quite dramatically. We've heard so much about the Ebola virus and the devastation it created. As you look at this and you think back, reflect back on the time that you were there, what is your major takeaway as far as it applies to all of us, especially the news media, even though the cameras are gone, the CNN effect has left the African countries, Ebola is in the rearview mirror, but what's the takeaway as to what we need to remember about this? Uh, we need to remember the people are still suffering and that we need to pay attention to them. That's why I wrote that book about it and that the caring is what really helps people to get through. As you saw in the, in the video, when people are together, when they know that just someone really cares about what's happening to them. Simple little things, like you saw that technique that I was doing with the burial team members and the children where you just go like this, you can imagine that this is very strong, like you're strong inside, and that you can not pull your fingers apart means that's how strong you can be inside you. Simple little things like that help the little ones, help everybody, and knowing that someone is paying attention and still cares about you even when the news has gone over and the, new, the cycle <laughs> changes. And even though you've written a book about Ebola, you've also found time to write Eco-Psychology, Advances from the Intersection of Psychology and Environmental Protection. What is the focus of this book and how does it tie into this Ebola virus well, and, and the environment in general? I think what's so important is that the UN agenda now that's been passed is really built on these three pillars, the economic and the social and the environment. And in fact, the environment is so tied to psychology. What eco-psychology means is that what's going on in the environment, in our ecosystem, affects us individually. Just even in a simple way to think that if one research showed patients in a hospital got better if they saw a picture that was of greenery, trees, or something mm -hmm. of the environment. And if they had a window where they saw the real trees and the environment, then those patients got better. So there is such an interaction between our immune system and really our environment, taking care of our environment. And a lot of events happen here at the United Nations every year. There is a, a meetings about high-level meetings about nature. So many countries in, at the UN and in the world know how interrelated our environment is with our psychological well-being. Now, you've participated in many of these United Nations meetings. Now, there are many good reasons that, uh, for having the United Nations, and one of the key reasons is it brings the players of the world together. It brings the, the public players, the, the governments of the world, it brings the private sector, the non-governmental organizations. How important is that to bring these folks together to talk about these? And as you mentioned, there's a myriad of meetings going on at the United Nations yeah. with some really high-ranking people and some very knowledgeable people. Yes, and actually, I'm glad you asked me that question because it's so important that what has changed in the 15 years that I've been here is that there is now a, a real kind of interaction between the government side and civil society. It means for people, for all of your viewers, that their voice matters. That is the thing to remember. Your voice matters. The governments are really listening. There is a focus now on what's called multi-stakeholder partnerships. What does that mean? That means that governments want to work with civil society. Who is civil society? The people and the NGOs and the international NGOs and all those organizations who do the work on the ground. It is essential to work together. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately financed, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections Television are solely those of the moderator and his guests. Our viewers are invited to check out the website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous shows. If you're interested in distributing our shows through PBS, community access television, educational institutions, a website, or any other media outlets, please go to our website for more information. Global Connections Television is provided as a public service at no cost. Today we're looking at a variety of issues ranging from the Ebola virus to through the environment to happiness and well-being. My guest today is an expert on all these issue areas. 
My guest today is Dr. Judy Kuriansky. Dr. Judy Kuriansky is a renowned international psychologist, humanitarian, author, United Nations advocate, award-winning journalist, and media personality. She is popularly known as Dr. Judy for giving advice on radio and television for over 30 years. Dr. Judy Kuriansky, we're talking about the Ebola virus. We're talking, we're going to move into a happier area now. Let's talk about well-being, happiness and well-being. You have been involved, you're a renowned international psychologist. You have been involved in working with the United Nations on various uh, well, really, programs at the UN on the agenda, the development agenda. Mm -hmm. What are you doing in this area to focus attention on really happiness and well-being, which we all want to experience? Yes, don't we all? That's uh, totally true. I, I actually, history has been made because well-being is now in the new UN global agenda. This is a major step forward. The Secretary General has mentioned well-being a couple of times, but through a partnership that is the chair of the Psychology Coalition, I partnered with Ambassador Dr. Caleb Otto from the mission of Palau to the UN, and he was quite astounding through the entire process of the Sustainable Development Goals negotiations to really promote mental health and well-being being in the Sustainable Development Goals and now in the agenda. And many other countries were supportive of this. He developed a Friends of Mental Health and Well-Being. Um, Ambassador Zinsu from Benin was uh, very, very helpful and supportive on the basis of not just Benin, but the least developed countries. Vietnam, Cyprus, Greece, many other countries were helpful in saying this needs to be in the agenda, and it is. So in target 3.4, above, you know, in, involved with 169 targets of the Sustainable Development Goals, there it is, promote mental health and well-being. This has tremendous implications for so many people who suffer from depressions and schizophrenia and, and st even stresses from work. Now programs and policy have a place where they can say this is in the agenda, along with some very major other issues, I might add, like poverty, eradicating <coughs> poverty and achieving health um, for all and education for all and uh, women's empowerment and the climate change addressing and all these other issues. So I'm very pleased that that is now something that is in the agenda. Our viewers can go to your website at drjudy.com to read a lot more about what we're doing or what we're talking about today and what you've been working on that is of interest to people, not only yes. in developing countries, but people all around the world. You've got and some very unique ideas and some very uh, outstanding programs underway. And the video that actually I produced is what describes this whole campaign. Excellent segue. Why don't we, you do have a video that's available and we're going to go to that and we'll come back and talk about it in just a moment. Let's go to the video. Teen Jordan Levinson goes to a school for youth with learning disabilities and wows everyone with his singing. Seventeen-year-old Joey Lowenstein, who has autism, snows everyone with his sports skills and communicates with a letter board. I want the world to know that people with autism are smart too. That people with mental health issues should be loved and sincerely supported by the community. 19-year-old Chiara de Blasio, daughter of the New York City mayor, publicly admitted her battle with depression and alcohol and drug I've use. I've had depression, like clinical depression, for like, my entire adolescence. Um, and so that's been something that I've always dealt with um, or not known how to deal with. There are about a billion young people in the world and it's estimated that about one in five of them have mental health problems. Yet, not enough of them, only about 20%, get the kind of help that they need. Getting sober is always a positive thing. To combat such shame um, and stigma, and, not, and to raise awareness, Kiara stars in this public service campaign. But it's so worth it. And now, the United Nations is also raising awareness about youth with mental health challenges. The Mental Health Matters campaign, organized by the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs and the Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, launched in June 2014 with a celebration on International Youth Day. And just this past July, 
In a historic move, governments of the UN agreed to include in their proposed text for the Sustainable Development Goals a commitment to promote mental health and well-being. These goals will take effect for the years 2015 to 2030. I see the youth as the, the real potential uh, leaders, the potential movement uh, to transform the world. In the UN spirit of partnership between governments and civil society, Ambassador Otto and the Palau Mission partnered with the Psychology Coalition at the United Nations that I chair. These developments are consistent with my work over many years answering youth's questions on the radio that showed they need to know they're not the only one with a problem, they're not abnormal, and there's hope and help. We want them to be able to say yes with power and strength. And also, the camp by UN NGO co-developed for African girls showed that teaching income-generating activities and life skills can help them avoid HIV-AIDS and get out of poverty. We HIV. I am saved, you see. And many workshops I've led for kids after disaster shows that music and simple exercises builds resilience. You are we are safe. Discussions were held with over 80 representatives from the 193 governments that are member states of the United Nations. The world cannot be sustainable unless people's well-being is also embraced. This is a very important breakthrough. The government has to take care of the youngsters because they are the future of the country. I mean, in order to give quality of life to your youth, you have to think in policies uh, to promote sports, to promote education. It tears me apart to see young people discarded on the streets, left to roam because they're quote-unquote abnormal in their behavior. I would like to see that eradicated. Ambassadors had advice for youth. Je demande aux jeunes d'aujourd'hui de rêver et de transformer leurs rêves en réalité. This is about your total strength and mental health is part of this strength in you. So I encourage you to be creative, to be energetic, to be active and be fearless. Global mental health is a major issue, and it seems as though it's getting a lot more attention today than it was not too many years ago. You're, as I recall, you mentioned earlier we were talking that you're going to be on a panel sponsored by the World Bank. Now, these are two United Nations agencies under the family of the UN. The World Bank, which deals with infra infrastructure development, that type of thing. And then you have the World Health Organization, which is a frontline agency of the United Nations dealing with problems in the, in the area of diseases and what have you. How important is it that these two, they're really two diverse or organizations or agencies within the UN system come together and host a conference like this uh, that you're going to participate in? I think what it shows, Bill, is the importance that mental health is being given throughout mm -hmm. the UN system. And this is very <coughs> good news for so many people who, who suffer consistently. You just saw so many young people who suffer from the autism spectrum disorders and from depression and alcohol and drug abuse. And so for the World Bank and WHO to be joining forces, along with many other of the UN agencies and governments uh, and civil society, is really very positive news for, ev for all of us, for the future of the world we want, as we call it at the UN, the world we want. <laughs> Uh, the world we all want, the world we need. <laughs> right, I mean. <laughs> that's exactly right. Now, another concept that's floating around ties into well being, obviously, is happiness. And there's a concept that this happiness index, the International Day of Happiness. What, how did this concept start? Who was involved in this? And why is it important that we should think about happiness as for individual countries and for the world as a whole? Well, happiness goes along with well-being, and there's a lot of research from the psychological point of view that shows how important happiness is to improve our immune system, for our health, for our relationships, for conflict with, for within relationships, but also within countries. And we've just, we've celebrated the International Day of Happiness every year on March. March 20th, because that is a resolution that the United Nations has made. And we had a wonderful event about that that's on UN webcast that everyone can go see. That was sponsored by the ambassador, Toriello, of the 
uh, government of Sao Tome and Principe. You have Who's interviewed been a him. guest on our show. And, yes. Right, and I'm ad an advisor to Ambassador uh -huh. Toriello. And through his Humanity program that you know very well, which brings the human side to diplomacy, uh, we had a tribute to Bhutan. So that's the answer to your question that, in fact, Bhutan is responsible really for starting this whole campaign about happiness. In 1972, mm -hmm. the king of the kingdom of Bhutan uh, decided that he was going to care about the happiness of his people. And through those years, the Gross National Happiness Index has been an alternative to just measuring the gross national product. So it's like the Beatles saying, money can't buy you love, that let's look at people's happiness as a way to measure the development of a country. And out of that now has become a lot of interest in what's called beyond GDP. It was something that we also negotiated about um, during the negotiations for the Sustainable Development Goals. So people are paying attention to that, which is very positive, mm -hmm. that this is a measure. As you me mentioned about <coughs> measurements, yes, people say, well, can you measure happiness? What, it, what is the way to really put an assessment about that? And in fact, the, there are assessments about that. It has been proven mm -hmm. that the World Happiness Report that you can measure happiness. And we're going to. <laughs> we have to. And there are other ways we can look at these criteria. But Dr. Judy Kurianski, I want to thank you so very much for being with me today. And thank you for a very interesting and a very informative program. <laughs> thank you, Phil. My it's pleasure. pleasure. <laughs> I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.